Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So have you gone on to the sum and difference identities yet? Um, one second. I believe we're doing factoring right now, actually. That's what we're doing right now. Factoring? Yes. Okay. You have some problems? Yes, one second. Okay. Factoring trig identities or, or trig equations or factoring algebraic equations? Uh, so, uh, factoring trig equations. Okay. Classic one is this one right here. Okay, I'm going to pull some up real quick. If I gave you that problem right there. You want to treat it like it's an algebraic quadratic. Okay. In other words, instead of sine x, this is x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0, which would mean x minus 2 times x plus 1. Well, if you factor this one, instead of x, just write sine x. So it's sine x minus 2 times sine x plus 1. Okay. Now, that particular problem is a classic because notice what happens when you go to solve it. You get two possibilities, sine x equals 2 or sine x equals negative 1. Which one of those is impossible? Um, wouldn't it be the negative 1? No, this one. I think they're the two, the two. Yeah, in other words... Negative one, when you add them, then it'll be negative well, one. Well, here's what the sine curve looks like. Never goes above one, never goes below negative one. But it, there's lots of places where it's equal to negative one. It's equal at three pi over two, and then, of course, two pi later, and so forth and so on. But... This is a typical factoring problem. This is called a quadratic in sine x. This is called a quadratic in x. This is called a quadratic in e to the x. One thing that's consistent with all of them is that this is this term squared. So if sine x is our middle term, that's it squared. e to the 2x is the square of e to the x. Okay. So if as long as you think about your trig functions, you can either think about them as quadratics or actually make the substitution. Uh, let uh, sine x equal u or something. And then we would have u squared minus u minus 2. Factor it algebraically, and then when you're done, go back and resubstitute sine x for u. Okay. All right, did you find one? Yes. Okay. Uh, solve for... 2 tan. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. 2 tangent x minus square root of 3 equals tangent x on the interval of 0 uh, 2 pi. Okay. What should we do here? Could we subtract the tangent? Uh-huh. So what do you get when you... In other words, we're going to do this just like an algebraic equation. Instead okay. Of x, we're going to deal in tangent of x. So I'm going to gather all my variables on the left side, and I'm going to gather all my numbers on the right side. 
So what's the next line after I do that? Um, wouldn't it be tangent x minus square root of 3 equals 0? Yeah, and now move the square root of 3 over so you get that. Now the question is, where does that occur? In other words, what angles are the tangent of x equal to the square root of 3? We haven't done enough work together that I've ever brought out my two triangles, but these are what I consider almost vital for a trick. Okay. Not only, I mean, you've been dealing with these triangles for a couple of years since algebra, definitely in geometry, the 30, 60, 90, and the 45, 45, 90. If you remember these dimensions, and I call these my unit triangles because the side opposite, the smallest angle is always 1, which makes that side that and makes that side that. That's 1. That's also 1. Makes that square root of 2. So if you memorize everything about these two triangles, all their dimensions, then you will be able to answer most all trig functions of first quadrant angles. Now, you know what I mean by first quadrant angles, right? Yes. You, you've gotten the unit circle already or yeah. not? Yes, the unit circle. Okay. So, if I look at these triangles, where is, what angle is the tangent of that angle equal to the square root of 3? 60 degrees. Okay. Since they gave you the domain in radians, let's answer in radians. What is 60 in terms of radians? Pi over 3. Okay. That's the first quadrant answer. What other quadrant is tangent positive in? Um... The bottom left one? Yeah, the third. Uh, third one. In okay. other words, it goes one, two, three, three, four, and the mnemonic is all students take calculus. A means all six trig functions, S means sine, T means tangent, C means cosine. So you can tell that tangent is positive in the third also. So now we need to come up with the third quadrant angle that's the same as pi over 3, basically. What is it? Uh, 4 pi over 3 on angle 240. Notice that we need to add 180 degrees to this thing, which is 2, which is pi. What am I thinking? Okay, and those are the two solutions in the unit circle. Okay. Okay, and that's the way we're going to do most all of these. They're going to give them to you where the answer is one of these common angles. In other words, 30, 60, 45, or multiples thereof. I'm going to leave those two triangles up. Okay, what's the next one? Okay, the next one is 4 sine squared x plus 1 equals 4. Okay. First step? Uh, subtract 1. Okay. Next step? Um, get rid of the numbers. Well, divide both sides by 4. Okay. Okay, in other words, we're, we're trying to isolate sine x. So now we got that. Now what's the next step? Square root. What's the answer to this? Sine x equals 
plus or minus. The plus or minus is very important here. If you don't put the, both the plus and the minus, you'll miss two of the answers. How is that? Well, you'll see. Where is the sine of x equal to square root of 3 over 2? Which angle down here? Um, 2 pi over 3. Well, the first one is pi over 3, right there. Okay. The plus sign. So we got x equals pi over 3. That's the 60 degree angle. What, it's a what, is, what other quadrant is it positive that's the equivalent to pi over 3? Um, the second quadrant at 1 pi. Uh, which is 2 pi over 3. In other words, that's the equivalent angle to pi over 3. Mm -hmm. But now the minus, there's two quadrants where it's minus, the third and the fourth. So what's the third quadrant? Uh, 240 degrees at 4 pi over 3. And the last one? Um, fourth quadrant? 5 pi over 3. Now notice that had I only put the plus answer, I would have only gotten those two answers. Having both the plus and the minus gave me, those are the two minus answers there. It's one of the most common mistakes that I see in algebra and trig and all of math is that when you are solving an equation by taking the square root of both sides, Always begin your answer with plus or minus. I mean, I wish there was a little song, you know, how they teach you a song for memorizing the quadratic formula and your ABCs and everything else complicated. Mm -hmm. I wish they had a song for teaching that because I'm not kidding you that 95% of my students omit the plus or minus. And that always costs them a couple of points because, uh, you lose answers if you omit it, as you could see in this problem here. Okay, what else? Um, cosine x, sine x equals 3 cosine x. Okay, uh, is the first step. Um, I actually have no idea. Okay. Can I get rid of one of the cosines? It's a little bit tricky. It's tempting to want to divide by cosine x. Mm-hmm. But you can't divide an equation by a variable if that variable might be zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that the cosine of pi over 2 is zero. So if pi over 2 were a solution, we would completely lose it by dividing both sides by cosine x. And I mean it would disappear. We would not see it. It would be like we didn't find it. So the way to really solve this is to move everything to one side. I'm going to move everything to the right side. Only because I'm then going to factor out a cosine x. Now, just like a quadratic from before, if we now have the product of two things is equal to zero, well, then we're going to find our answer by setting each of those things equal to zero. So where is the cosine of x equal to zero in the unit circle? Um, 
Coast Diamondbacks. Pie over two. Uh huh. Where else? Uh, three pie over two. Okay, so that's two answers. And where is that equal to zero? Um, two pie. Nowhere. Oh. Again, that would call for sine x being equal to three. Oh, well, okay. And never mind. Remember, sine and cosine can never be greater than one or less than minus one. So mm -hmm. we can ignore that part there. And that becomes the only two places. Now, notice what happens if I would have divided both sides by cosine x. I would have had this. Sine x equals 3, no solution, and I would have totally missed both of those solutions. And the reason you miss them is because I divided by something that could be 0. And in fact, 0 was one of my solutions, and I lost it. Because once you divide by a variable that might be 0, you never find that solution. It's kind of an interesting phenomena. Okay. So factoring is pretty much what you want to use. It's not a whole lot different than algebraic solving algebra equations. What else? Um, I have sine x tangent x minus sine x equals zero. Equals zero? Yes. Okay. This is going to be pretty much like the last one, only we didn't have to move anything. What's my first step going to be? Uh, my first step shall be, couldn't I factor out a sine? Sine x, what's left? Tangent. Tangent x minus 1. Okay. Now, what can I say now? Uh, like the areas where sine x is equal to 0. Are? Um, pi. 0 and pi. Zero In other words, it starts out at zero. Okay. And in your domain, they should have a bracket around the zero, right? Mm-hmm. And a parenthesis around the two pi? Yes. Okay. So those both are valid. And what else can I say? Um, then whenever tangent is equal to negative one, well, you have to set that oh, equal to zero, which means tangent would have to be equal to one. Okay. Now, where does that occur? It can't be less than zero, right? Tangent actually can go anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity. If you, okay. If you look at the tangent curve, it looks like this. Okay. With asymptotes every pi. So its range is a lot different than sine and cosine. It's not restricted. Oh. But where is it equal to 1? Look at this picture right there, that triangle. So pi over 4? Yeah. What other quadrant? And the fourth quadrant, 5. Well, all, all students take calculus going counterclockwise. Oh, third, third quadrant. Okay. Five, three, four. Okay. So you've got four solutions. There's two of them, and there's two more. And if you put any of those four solutions into this, it will be a valid equation. Okay. Okay. Now, the one type problem that we haven't gone over, and... I would want to before we end today's session is where you have a combination something like sine squared x minus cosine of x plus
plus 1 equals 0. Or let's say, uh, yeah, let's just say that, for example. Now, normally, if I can't factor it, it's hard to say that I'm going to put that into the product of two things equals 0. And that's the way we've solved every problem so far. It's just that the ones you could factor had same trig functions. Either it was all in sine or all in cosine, or you could factor it into two different trig functions that were multiplying one another. When you have this situation, you have to use your Pythagorean identity for that, which is 1 minus cosine squared minus cosine x Let's make that a 2. No, let's make that a... a 1, just like we had it. Now, notice that I can, I now have a quadratic in cosine x. If I move everything to the right side, I end up with cosine squared x plus cosine x minus 2 equals 0. In other words, that's the same equation. Now I have a quadratic in cosine fully, and I can factor it just like, you know, it would be cosine x minus 2 times cosine x plus 1. Or, I'm sorry, the other way around. Cosine x plus 2 times cosine x minus 1 equals 0. And now I can come up with a solution. So this might be the highest level of difficulty you're going to run into, and, and you might not be looking at anything like that. Are you seeing any problems like that on your worksheet? Uh, no. Okay. Well, let's not get ahead of the game, then. especially if we have a session tomorrow. I suspect you'll probably see some of those kind by then. Okay. What else do you have today? We still have like 10 minutes. Um, I have 2 cosine squared x plus 3 cosine x minus 2 equals 0. Okay. Factor that just like you would a algebraic quadratic. So it would be 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0 and cosine x plus 2 equals 0. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. And, and then go from there. Um, well, just, just uh, out of curiosity, before we go further, what if I couldn't factor it nicely? What am I going to do? Divide. Use the quadratic formula. Okay. In other words, make this a 5. I have no way to factor it. Go, to, go in and use the quadratic formula. Only instead of x being equal to minus b, it's cosine x equals minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay? So, and you may not see anything like that either. But if you did, it's perfectly acceptable to use the quadratic, form, or the quadratic formula to solve these. But what's the next step again? Um, so could I divide? Well... Either that's got to be zero, or that's got to be zero. So I think I should try dividing two out of cosine x? No. In other words, I'm not quite sure if I'm hearing you right, but once I get it down to one quantity times another quantity, it has to be equal to zero. Okay. Well, then I know that either that's equal to zero, or that's equal to zero has to be. Otherwise, you can't multiply two numbers together and have them come out to be zero unless that's true. So the okay. next step is 2 cosine x minus 1 is equal to zero. 
Solve that, you get cosine x equals one half. Where does that occur? That occurs on pi over three. And the first quadrant, and what other quadrant? Five pi over three, and that's located on the fourth. Correct. And then that is the rest of it. So cosine x plus two equals zero. Where does that occur? Um, cosine x equals negative two. Doesn't it not occur anywhere? You got it. And, uh, okay. Okay. In other words, yeah, we can cross that one out. That's impossible. So our only solution becomes that. Okay. Okay, what else? Um, I think you're getting the idea, though. In other words, we yes. only, we're always setting it equal to zero. We're always turning it into the product of two things. And then we're setting each of those things equal to zero. So I have square root of two. Cosine x plus one equals zero. Okay. Next line. We're just um, call for cosine x. What do you got? So wouldn't I divide everything by square root of two? Well, first of all, you got to move the one over. Oh, minus one. Yeah, minus one. Then divide by square root of two. Then it'll be a negative or cosine equals negative one over square root of two. But now, you can't have square root on the bottom. Well, right. You actually can. That's the same number as this. It's just you would never give an answer like that. Okay. Okay. But you'll notice in my pictures, my drawing, you end up getting one over square root of two quite easily. In other words, that occurs at 45 degrees. And it would actually be counterproductive to go in and change that to this. They don't want to know what cosine of x is equal to. They want to know what x is equal to. So I don't actually need to make that conversion. I don't need to rationalize the denominator because I know that that angle occurs, that's basically my pi over 4 angle, but it's in the which quadrant? Um, in quadrant, so 3, 5, or 4. Quadrant 2. And? Quadrant. There's three. always two quadrants for a, a normal angle. There aren't always two answers for, you know, cosine equals 0 or 1, but so quadrant two and three, what's the quadrant two answer? Um, quadrant two answer, that would be three pi over four. And the quadrant three answer? Five pi over four. There you go. And notice that we didn't need to do this at all. And in fact, if I'm trying to find my answers from these two pictures, I don't see square root of 2 over 2 anywhere in there. Now, it's true that I could, some high schools will actually give you the dimensions on this one as being, oops, excuse me, as being square root of 2, square root of 2, and they'll make this 2. And this is the standard model. And it's because they want it to come rationalized, usually. And when you're talking sine and cosine, it comes out to be square root of 2 over 2. Uh, and they're more comfortable with that. But, of course, if you're doing secant and cosecant, you're going to get 2 over square root of 2, and then you got to rationalize it anyway. So I prefer to go with the model that has 1s, 
especially if I'm going to call them my unit triangles. Uh, and then you know how to start it always in your memory. Okay. But if this is my model, then I'm actually better off knowing the cosine was 1 over square root of 2 rather than square root of 2 over 2. All right. That's a good stopping spot, Taylor. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Have a good day.